Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Off Axis Podcast, where we talk entertainment, acrobatics, business, entrepreneurship, fitness, and more. Thank you guys for tuning in. If you guys want to support, please share with your friends. Now, let's jump into the podcast. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Off Axis Podcast. Today, I have Dave Matz here, special guest. Dave, I'm really excited about this interview because you have a lot of interesting stuff going on. And can you just give us like some of your origin story and like how you got started in uh, circus stuff in the first place? Um, yeah, I was kind of like wandering around in college, had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. Um, up until that point, I was like a semi-professional gamer, uh, competed in uh, Dance Dance Revolution and Tony Hawk. Uh, made some decent money doing that uh, and tried everything in college. I tried singing, acting, dance. Uh, you name it, I tried it and uh, kind of stumbled into a circus cra- class and fell in love with it. And then uh, was doing that while I finished up my college degree, uh, kind of appeased the parents and all that jazz. Um, and then I got an offer to go to Japan with a circus and I was like, oh shit, I can actually do this and make a living off this. What was the first thing that you were doing? Was it Sear Wheel? No, Sear Wheel was like my retirement act. Ah. Um, I started out with like hoop diving, Chinese pole. Like we had a Chinese acrobatics class in our college. And uh, yeah, they just kind of gave me a good crash course in being a circus generalist. Um, But yeah, Chinese pole, hoop diving, aerial, um, some partner acrobatics, juggling, unicycling, stilt walking. They kind of ran the gamut. Dang, so you were learning everything. Yeah. I had no idea about all that stuff, especially the gaming stuff. You were playing Tony Hawk? Yeah. Professionally? I, pro, pro, I mean, as professionally <laughs> as you could back in the early 2000s. Dude, um, I loved that game. But I think I made, like, uh, my best year was, like, 30 grand I made in, like, different competitions and stuff. Okay. So, yeah. So you were just playing Tony Hawk, like, whoever comes up with, like, the highest score or something like that? Yeah. Um, I was maxing out, like, a lot of the levels at, like, I think the the cap at the time on Tony Hawk 4 was, like, 2 billion or something. Oh, my um, God. And I think I was ranked, like, number two or three in the world at the time. Uh, so, like, whenever I'd go to competitions in L.A. or whatever, um, it was fairly easy to mop the floor. That is... And, that's uh, unique. Yeah. One of the competitions I won was at the Boom Boom Huck Jam. I got to meet Tony Hawk. Uh, it was in uh, the stadium that uh, the LA Lakers play in. Yeah. Uh, and we were technically like the halftime show of the show, which was like, I guess, my first halftime performance. So they just have you guys play in like uh, and like project it somewhere or something? Yeah. They had it on the Jumbotron and like there's like 20,000 screaming fans. And yeah. You know, that's funny because I always, I always think it's weird when people are watching video games, but I think I would totally watch like a professional play Tony Hawk Pro Skater. It's it's super cool, but like at the same time, it just goes on forever. Like some of those combos were like 15, 20 minutes long. Like, yeah, you just keep reverting into a manual, right? Ex- oh, shit, you know. I know. I used to play. That was like the one game I was really good at. Never was like competing or anything. I didn't even know that was a thing. We're going to have to play sometime. Dude, I would... Yeah, I would do pretty good, but I didn't know it was like even a competition or anything. I didn't know that was, I don't think video games were like, I think I stopped playing video games when I was like 13 or 14 years old. So there wasn't really like, what year would you put this at? Uh, Probably like 2003, 2004, like somewhere around there. Um, It was like Xbox Live and stuff. um, It was on uh, the I was a PlayStation gamer, so uh, it was on whatever their uh, their online service was for PS2. Yeah, I used to play this uh, paintball game called Greg Sa- Greg Hastings Paintball when Xbox Live first came out, mm-hmm. and I was like ranked top five in the world at the time. Heck yeah, but that was as far as I got into it, and then I was like, I'm just gonna actually go to the skate park. Yeah. So okay, so where was your first like show that you started? actually performing circus stuff um well like part of that program uh the head of our theater arts department was like a six foot seven tall white guy who was adopted in china and spoke spoke fluent chinese um he toured around with ringling for a long time and he made some friends with some chinese acrobats um yeah and uh he brought one of them in to train us for this series of three shows so that was part of the boot camp was we did uh a touring show called Monkey Magic. I was the Monkey King, um, doing like different acrobatics and rope spinning and juggling all these different things. Um, we did a show called uh, The Dragon Wakes, um, which was a theatrical show, and then we did a production of uh, Barnum the Musical. Um, and uh, yeah, those were like my first performances, and our first paid performance was for Winnie McKay of the LA Circus, 
we did uh, Chinese polls for her uh, in Orange County somewhere. Um, and we were getting like, I think it was like 50 bucks a day for six shows a day. And we were just like, yeah, we're paid acrobats. We were Whoa. so excited. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I reconnected with her after college uh, was done. I was working on an episode of Bones. Uh, I was just a background artist doing a uh, unicycling on it. And she's like, oh. Oh, you do. I forgot you do all this stuff. Like, do you have a passport? Yeah. Do you have a criminal record? No. Do you want to go to Japan? Yeah. That's cool. So, uh, yeah, that was my first like real contract. And then it's kind of been leveling up since then. Have you been to Japan since then? Yeah, I've been to Japan six times. I think I've spent like a year and a half of my life out there. It's one of my favorite countries. That's cool. That's one of the places that I want to go to. I just haven't been there yet. Oh, dude, you're going to love it. Like, yeah. When you, when you do, not if you do, uh, let me know and I'll give you a list of some of the coolest stuff to do. Have you been to Taiwan? Uh, I have not. We we had a contract in Taiwan after one of our contracts in Japan with uh, Le Noir, um, and it just fell through. Uh, I've heard nothing but good things, though. Yeah, we went recently. I was wondering how similar it was to Japan, but I guess we'll just have to get out there. Um, so you, you haven't performed for too many big shows, right? I feel like as far as as long as I've known you, you've always been doing kind of your own thing. Yeah. Um, for, I mean, for probably like six or seven years, I toured with a show called Lenoir and we did like 20 something countries. Um, but it was more of like a Spiegel world, uh, intimate cabaret style show, but with a lot of really good acts. Um, and then when I quit that, I was just like, okay, I'm going to start my own company, do my own thing, create my led wheel and just focus on like, doing the things that I want to do rather than kind of uh, being at the mercy of someone else. Yeah, that was kind of the route that I wanted to take. As far as long as I've known you, you've always been doing the LED wheel. When was the first time you started doing that? Uh, it was about eight years ago now. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, on my 30th birthday, I uh, decided I was going to make the LED wheel because like, I was kind of capping out at how much money I could make. Um, I was getting offers to be double booked. I needed something to where I could like franchise it and whatnot. And I also wanted to get into uh, NBA halftime shows. And I reached like five different dead ends because there was already a serial performer. Yeah. So I was like, okay, well, uh, time to put on my big boy pants when I turn 30. Um, yeah, just kind of like spent the next like year developing that and then launched it. And, uh, the rest is history. How long does it take? Like how many led wheels do you have? Uh, I probably have like somewhere between 12 and 14. That's a lot. Yeah. Okay. And they're all different sizes and everything. Yeah. I think I have three or four on my size and then the rest are just various sizes. I, not all of them work right now. It's yeah. basically like I just do repairs when they're needed. Yeah. Um, and I've been upgrading them to some new software and new boards that we developed. So yeah. How long does that take to make one? Uh, I think I clocked it last time I made one at like 30 hours. 30 hours? Yeah. It's actually pretty pretty fast compared yeah. to what I thought it was, but you've done it so many times. Well, but I also don't make the wheels. I, I buy wheels from a manufacturer I trust, and then I retrofit them, uh, route in everything, put the LEDs, all the, the batteries yeah. and whatnot. So the the LED strips go under the skin, yeah? Uh, some people do it that way. Mine are actually embedded in the skin. Um, oh, because uh, under the skin, it's harder to do repairs. Like that would make sense on yeah. site. Um, you have to like cut through the skin. Uh, mine, I route into it, put them into that, and then I layer epoxy over so I can cut into them and do repairs when TSA inevitably messes them up. Yeah, and uh, so cereals come in like four to five pieces. Are yours? You have to connect each one together or something? Uh, for the first few years, yeah. Now I'm working with uh, some boards that are all wireless. So Whoa. no connectors. It just, it saves so many problems. Yeah. Dang. That's crazy. So how, like you book those pretty often. Yeah. Yeah. A couple times a week. I feel like every time I've ever worked with someone doing led wheel, they were using one of your wheels. Hopefully. How I many mean... <laughs> other people are really doing that though? Not uh, many, right? Now there are a lot, but like the, the biggest problem is people will buy the led wheels and then they don't know how to do repairs on them. Uh, they'll book them for a few gigs and then run into an issue usually texting me and I'm like, sorry, I don't work on other people's LEDs. Yeah. Um, and then that's the last I hear of them in the like corporate and event world. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I've kind of stayed away from LED stuff. I'm like, I, it's just one thing I don't really want to learn how to do. And it seems so tedious. It's a headache. It's tedious. 
it can be worth it, but you have to be like willing to like go through the pain in the ass that is LEDs. Yeah. I've always put off a I've always wanted to learn how to weld. And finally, after so many welders bailed on my projects that I was trying to get them to do, I just bought a welding set and it's outside. Nice. I just did my first welds like earlier today and it, well, it looks like I toasted a piece of metal. Yeah. So I have no idea what I'm doing yet, but yeah. it's interesting. Each weld has gotten slightly better, but it still looks like I'm just toasting this thing. Do you know how to weld at all? Yeah. I took some classes in college. Same type of thing. Is the aluminum something that you know how to do? Uh, I, I've done a little bit of aluminum, but like I wouldn't. I wouldn't be the guy for that. Uh, yeah, so you bought a TIG welder or? A uh, MIG. MIG? Yeah. Okay. I've been told that TIG is the way to go for aluminum. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Yeah. Because I've welded steel and stuff, like, when I was a little kid, just a little bit here and there. I yeah. welded, like, my teeter board and everything. Nice. But I just, I'm just i tired of lifting really heavy stuff, so I was like, all right, I'm just going to stick with aluminum and just only buy aluminum. Yeah. And I'm just going to learn how to do this. Ooh. So far, it's been a nightmare, and every welder I've talked to is like, oh, yeah, that's, like, a whole different ball game. It's a whole different ball game, and if your welds aren't immaculate, uh, especially since you're doing stuff that's structural, like, it will break down relatively quickly. Um I like aluminum might be one of those things that like for these things you just hire out or you're gonna have to put on a lot of time for it yeah from my understanding yeah I figured that one out so far so what else have you been doing as far as like your own business stuff goes you started a warehouse which pretty much every single uh aerial person's reel I've seen is in your warehouse yeah pretty much I mean I started it for myself um I call it the dream factory um, and then I kind of open it up. It's all donation based. Um, and all the money that comes into it, uh, goes back into the space to make it better for other artists and for myself to use as well. Um, the original plan for it was to be building a full show. Uh, and we built it during the pandemic. So I had that on hold and I'm finally starting to like plan and uh, create some of the acts that I want for uh, my full tech based show yeah. that I want to launch uh, want to launch next year interesting so do you guys typically put on your own shows like 20 30 minute shows or is it just kind of corporate gigs that you do uh, I do mostly corporate gigs because that it's like minimal effort maximum money keeps me like free to work on the projects I want to work on um, and then also just funds all the other things. Like that's how I was able to afford my warehouse was doing the corporate gigs. So sometimes I feel like a little bit of a corporate sellout as far as you can be in the circus industry, but like it's helped me to create the art I want to, uh, I want to create as well as help other artists kind of build bigger and better things. Yeah. We've been doing corporate gigs for a few years now and I've noticed a trend. So I'll, I'll get some random production company. They'll reach out and be like, Hey, are you guys available for this date? How much blah, blah, blah. And I'll give them the rates and everything a day later, or even sometimes a couple hours later, I get another email from a different company. Yeah. And they're like, Hey, are you available for this thing? And I'm like, yeah, sure. And then a couple hours later, I get another one. So there's all these like corporate event planners and stuff. Is that, is that something that you come across frequently? Multiple corporate planners asking you for your prices? Uh, yeah, bidding for the same event or just... Yeah, for the same event. Oh, all the time. And that's like one of the great things. Because um, I've had people asking me if I could I'd sell my Volta wheels and stuff. And I'm so happy I haven't because... Uh, Create competition I, for yourself. Every time that happens, uh, they'll call around to other serial artists and they're like, oh yeah, I can do that, but you got to talk to David. Oh yeah, yeah I can do that, but you got to talk to David. And it's helped me keep the rates high because they're just shopping around like to find a lower price. And if it all comes into the same pipeline, then it's like, oh, shit. OK, I guess we got to pay it. Yeah. Yeah, I've noticed that, too. We get similar types of things. And a lot of people, so I hate when people take our videos and they, they'll sell this act. And then they're like, all right, hey, we got this gig. How much do you want? Yeah. And we'll say, like, I don't know, 5,000. They're like, oh, can you do 2,000? And I'm oh like, oh, my God. No. Yeah. No. And then next thing you know, you find a bunch of like young kids and people inexperienced doing tramp ball. And then kind of sucks because it's like, well, they used like off access footage to book that event. And now someone else is doing it. Yeah. For, like I, a really cheap rate. I, I, I used to get like really upset about that kind of stuff. And then I realized, you know what? Like everybody's got their rate that they're uh, willing to work for. Mm. And like we were both in that position at some point. 
Like yep. the best thing to do is just to find out who it is and educate them. Like I've had people uh, booking LED wheel gigs for like 500 bucks when they just got an LED wheel. And I'm like, well, you shouldn't be taking a regular wheel gig for 500 bucks. It should be a thousand or more. Yeah. Um, I'm charging 2,500 to three grand for any LED wheel gig. Like that's what the market will bear. Um, just kind of educating them, let them know. Cause I, I, I remember trying to find that information and everybody was so guarded with it. Um, but that's not good for the industry. Like, yeah, we're, we're all trying to like learn, we're all trying to grow. Um, and if they learn that like, oh shit, we shouldn't be telling, uh, selling tramp wall for two grand Yeah. next time we'll sell it like at the same rate, then at least there's parity. Yeah. Um, and we can all kind of stand together. Yeah, I agree. We should put a, together a menu, right? <laughs> <laughs> Corporate events menu. This is around what you guys should be charging. Yeah. I mean, it would help be good because everyone's kind of just guessing, you know, Oh, every time I'll like increase my prices by a little bit. I'm like, all right, we'll see how much we can get. And recently I started doubling them. I'm like, they didn't bat an eye. I'm like, all right, cool. I guess this is our new rate. Exactly. But then everyone saw that people are like, ah, that's pretty expensive. So, I mean, it's kind of just a random because you don't even know what they're charging or what they can possibly afford. I like when people are just like, hey, we have this much. What can you do? Yeah. Oh, that's great. Like, especially yeah. if they're straight shooters. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's such a weird guessing game where, like, like, what's your budget? I don't know. What's your rate? And you just kind of go back and forth until one person guesses a number. Yeah. And go from there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because it's hard to put, like, a well, this is our menu of price. Like, we have a menu basically for the fair shows because it's the same. I mean, they all talk to each other and they all, like, are in the, you know, they know, like, oh, you charge this person. So it's easier for that kind of stuff, but the corporate gigs are like, you never know. Like, we did at Allegiant recently, and I thought our prices were pretty good. Yeah. And then we're like, oh, yeah, so we're just going to put one uh, trample on one side of the end zone and then one on the other. And I was like, all right, cool. And then didn't realize, like, oh, we're going to have to, like, legitimately carry some stuff across an entire football field and then all the way back and do it in one day. And then whew, it was quite a lot of work. Yeah. It's it was the most work I've ever done in one day for sure. Oh really? And it didn't seem like that big of a deal because I was like, oh yeah, the, I mean, there's probably like carts or something they'll have in. And they were like, nope, no carts on the grass or. Yeah, yeah, the the grass is like super protected there. You can't put anything on there. There's got to be rubber mats under everything. Oh, that's wild. Yeah, it made a uh, it made setup quite difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, like uh question for you like how have you grown into like creating doing more shows and stuff and how have you priced that differently um because i'm running into the problem right now of uh like with my indoor acrobatic drone swarm where a performer flips through the drones and kind of like summons them like he's a jedi wizard yeah um a lot of the clients are like really interested and then they're like "Ooh, wait how much um so like i'm experiencing a little growing pains i want to know if like you yeah, experience like it's that. too expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, when I first created this show, that was like a big problem was trying to find clients that would be able to afford that. And um, I mean, we only sh- sold one of these shows in like the first five years. And then now I've kind of found like the right market and everything for it. Um, so you think it was more of a market shift than like a, it was just a finding the or... right clients. Yeah. Because yeah. we haven't adjusted our prices really. It's just finding the right clients and that certain niche that would be interested in that stuff. And then we got like an agent too who already had like the in with a bunch of places. And I've realized doing business is not really like, like if you know someone and I've met this person and we've seen like eye contact to each other and shook hands, like I'm much more likely to book with this person regardless of the price than someone over the phone. Cause if they're just seeing an email with numbers and stuff that personal connection isn't there. And the more I like do business, the more I realize if I can meet these people in person or even just get on the phone with them, I call them like right, right away. Mm -hmm. And I find that that is a better way to book and they'll find a budget for you. Oh, a hundred percent. Like, uh, and then, uh, sorry, I was going to say it like price anchoring too. You know, if you have, let's say you're trying to sell your drone swarm for 10,000 bucks. If you also have, another drone swarm option or something that's just added mm-hmm. for 20,000 bucks that 10,000 bucks they feel like they're getting a steal so they're like oh we can find 10,000 bucks yeah so if you just have I mean it's easiest to sell 
a really big option when there's a bigger option available and you have like the proof of concept of that I've done this before. Yeah, I did that originally with my Volta wheels. I like immediately made an HD Volta wheel and I charged an extra grand um, for that same reason because it made the regular one seem cheap by comparison. And like, I think I've only booked that like three or four times in the eight years that I've been doing this. Um, But especially like in the beginning, it was really instrumental to like being able to get over that uh, the price hurdle. Yeah. So you said you were working on a new show that you wanted to do in Vegas. Yeah. Can you tell me about this? Um, it's going to be like a dystopian, futuristic cyberpunk, like interactive game show. Um, and uh, all all of the acts are going to be kind of like competing for healthcare in my ideal world. Ah, nice. Um, just kind of like social commentary on like, yeah, in the future, healthcare sucks even more. Um, to where there's just game shows around it. Yeah. Uh, I may or may not keep that idea, but it's all going to be tech based acts, and each one is kind of kind of be driven by that story of like, oh, the contortionist like uh, has to do this fake diamond heist through lasers, and that's like her reason. So she's like doing one arm handstands to dodge the lasers rather than just doing an act. That's interesting. So everything's going to be tech based. Mm-hmm. Sounds like a nightmare for me. I would never want to do something oh, like that. <laughs> I, I, this is why I've had this idea in my head for like six or seven years. Yeah. And this is why I'm just doing it now because I feel like each one of the acts that I'm creating uh, is to the point where it's relatively hassle free. Yeah. Would you do the drone stuff in that? Yeah. The drones are going to be a big part of it. Um, I'm also buying a giant robot arm uh, that's used for like making cars and stuff. Um, that I'm going to be making probably four or five different acts. So I actually just got off the phone with, uh, I have two robot guys that I'm consulting with. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm like almost done with my research on that and about to pull the trigger, which I'm a little nervous about cause that's, it's like a whole other can of worms. Yeah. So robot arm. So you would do acts based with this robot arm maybe like aerial or something like that yeah like aerial chinese pole uh i might do like a fake bonkeen number where uh the performers are getting like launched off of like a platform or like a chair or something yeah um basically i just at this point need to pick one learn what it can and can't do um learn how safe i can make it uh and then start creating the acts interesting well that's super unique and those kind of ideas sell for sure so how do you, like, if you don't mind me asking, how do you do this drone swarm stuff? Like, do you program each one separately? Yeah, so I have, like, 3D software that we uh, developed for some off the, uh, off-the-shelf off drones uh, from China uh, that are made for swarms, but we've, like, we got a hold of their source code, hired a programmer, made it so that, like, because theirs weren't allowing performers to be, like, in the middle of them. Yeah. And I'm like, well, that's kind of... Like the point. Yeah. It's like, I want someone to be able to flip through a hoop made of drones. Um, so yeah, we have semi custom software that we're making better and better right now. We have to move each drone individually through space on a time code. Okay. Um, but eventually we want to be able to like, just drop in like a 3d model of like, Oh, your client wants a duck or whatever it is. We, we did a food event the other day and we had to like, move 30 drones through space to make pizza float in the air and like we want to be able to just drop in a model of pizza uh like a 3d model uh and tell the drones go and make them not collide get to that point and yeah man i wouldn't even know where to start that sounds so crazy it was three years and two failed projects i had like two two versions before this uh before it worked yeah and now it's finally like paying off and like paying itself back so Man, I don't even like flying my regular drone. That's just, <laughs> it's hard enough. Well, this is once it's once it's good, you just press go. Yeah. Like, Are they like pretty small? The drones? Yeah, they're they're about this big, and they're yeah. uh, sub two fifty grams with uh, guarded props. So like, if they hit anybody, um, then they won't cause damage to people or property. Yeah, that would suck. I've yeah. been hit by a drone before, and it hurt <laughs> a couple times. I like, cut my hand open really bad. Oof. Yeah, I was at the Grand Canyon. My drone. I turned it on yeah and it wasn't working for some reason i was like that's weird so i like 
put the remote down and I like go as I'm about to go pick up the drone to see why it's not working, it it's decides like, oh. that it's just gonna go now. Yeah. Even though the remote is off and I couldn't control it, so it just went up like that and I was like at the edge of the green can and there's like people everywhere and I yeah. was like, Uh oh. <laughs> like oh, I put shit. my hand on the blades and just like cuts everywhere Ooh. across my hand. It was a bad trip to the Grand Canyon. Have you been hit by a drone before? Oh yeah. Yeah. A couple of times. I've got a few little scars and stuff from when uh when I was learning FPV. Yeah. Do you still do that stuff? Yeah, I still do gigs here and there with it. Um I mean for a little while, like when the pandemic was hitting, like I had a goal of becoming a professional FPV pilot and getting into movies and stuff. Um and I shot two movies with that and I still get like probably a gig or two a month. So it's a fun little side hustle and it like breaks up all the circus gigs. So. Yeah. So that could be your new retirement gig. Yeah, exactly. Flying drones. Dude, I love it. Like, it's so fun. Yeah. So how was it? You created this giant warehouse. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like making a warehouse? Because I don't think anyone else who's listening to this has made a warehouse before. Uh, we had no idea what we were doing. Uh, basically, like, I bought a kit. Um it's like a giant erector set and I was going to hire a company to do it like originally. Um, and the foundation got poured a week into the pandemic and I was like, well, I have no idea when I'm going to be making money again. So I called all my friends that are handy with tools. Some people, uh, knew how to like run heavy machinery. I was like, Hey guys, like if you want to use it, you can use it whenever you want. I'm buying food. We'll have purpose during the beginning of this pandemic. Hopefully this blows over by the time we're done. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we just figured it out piece by piece. A lot of times as we were assembling the building, we had no idea how to do things because the instructions were just super janky. So we'd like look up YouTube videos on like how to build a warehouse and find like different things. And over the course of five weeks, we figured it out. Yeah. So there's actually tutorials on how to build a warehouse. Uh, yeah. Like how to build a, a prefab steel structure um, and like pretty much like 90% of the questions we had were available on YouTube. Someone had gone through this problem. So yeah. it was pretty great. Interesting. What what did that like cost you to make the warehouse? Um it wasn't that bad. I think all together it was like 120 or 130 grand for a 4400 square foot warehouse. Okay. Um it's pretty expensive, but Well, but the thing is is like I coming from LA, we had a warehouse that we were caretakers for. When we created a bunch of our acts, like I created the Volta wheel uh, my buddy Simon created sway poles. We had trampoline wall and we were caretakers for the building till the wrecking ball came. Um, yeah. it was like just magical to be able to create without worrying when the wrecking ball came. Um, I was like, okay, well, how do I create this or recreate this? And I looked in LA in Vegas and like the cheapest warehouses out here that were comparable size were like $3 million, $5 million, Jeez. uh, LA. 10 million plus for something half the size um so i was like well what if i just built this and then i like looked it up online saved my pennies yeah. invested in stocks and crypto and then cashed out some of that to build it um and i mean it was like what is that like three percent of the cost like yeah. it's not too bad yeah okay so are you still doing the crypto stuff um i still have crypto yeah. Uh, I don't really do anything with it. I have like my sell points and stuff, but uh, I'm kind of done investing as far as that. Uh, and every time it doubles, I'll sell a little Bitcoin or a little Ethereum. Yeah. But you still hold on to those Bitcoin and Ethereum? Yeah. Any other ones? Uh, I mean, I have some other ones in one of my wallets somewhere, but those are the only ones I, t I keep track of. Yeah. I have all my Ethereum staking. Uh, which means that basically it's passively mining for me or earning interest. Interesting. Um, uh, Ethereum, I think, is going to be the winner. Yeah. Uh, but I kind of, I was so absorbed in it for a while and then it crashed and then I got absorbed in it again and it crashed again. I'm like, oh, well, why don't I just, every time it crashes, buy a little and sit on it. Yeah. And then when it runs, sell some. Yeah. And then I don't have to like worry about it. It's not like occupying my brain space. So Yeah, that was why I sold everything. I was like, this is just ruining my day when it goes down yep and yeah. now i don't i'm i don't think about it because i've already made my money back like i don't touch it i have my rules um until it doubles again yeah and if it doesn't no big deal what about stocks do you do stocks at all uh yeah i still have a little bit of money in stocks um 
I think I got into them about seven, eight years ago. Um, and I, I've gotten pretty lucky just investing in tech stocks that I kind of knew a little bit more about than the average bear. Yeah. So what about real estate? Do you do real estate other than your own house? No. Um, I'd like to eventually, but the market's too hot. Like, yeah. I wouldn't mind buying a second or third property like at some point. Um, but I focused my efforts. I almost bought a second one. I bought the, almost bought the house next door. And I was like, you know what? Instead of having two mortgages, why don't I just pay off my house and then I can do whatever I want? Yeah. Uh, so my house is paid off. Like I have next to no bills and it l- allows me the freedom to like be able to say no to gigs, take vacations or work on projects like my show. That's cool. So no bills. Yeah. I mean, I have insurance. Yeah. Insurance. Yeah. But like, yeah, no rent, no mortgage. Dang. Yeah. Must be nice. It's nice, but it also like kills your motivation a bit. I, yeah, I felt that like, uh, when I had my, I recently, like about a year ago, paid off all, all my stuff and my rent was pretty low at the time. Yeah. And I found myself just fucking off and not doing anything. Yep. And I was like, I feel like I need that weight again. So I went and bought a really expensive truck. Nice. And I just work better when I have to. I, I'm the same way. Like, that's why pretty much right now, every time I do a gig, I'm like, okay, cool. That's a couple grand towards buying the robot arm. That gets me closer to this goal. Like, yeah, uh, it doesn't have to necessarily be the weight of something, but like, I have to have some sort of bigger goal or else I'm like, I don't really want to do this gig. I don't want to like work on this project. Yeah. So, um, I guess it is sort of a weight. Yeah. 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 I, f- I always call it like a financial exercising when you have like a certain amount of bills, like it's, I've generally think that it's better to like increase your bills as you get older because if you don't then you just get accustomed to making two thousand bucks a month or something like that Mm -hmm. but as your bills get bigger you figure out different ways like you have to be more creative on different ways to make money and people who like listen to dave rams would say that's pretty idiotic but i find myself just figuring out better ways to make money when i have like a higher bill that i need to pay off every single month yeah a hundred percent. I mean, yeah, you kind of have to work with work, uh, work with what works for you psychologically. And I'm like the same way. If I don't have a bigger goal or something that I'm trying to reach, I'll just stay at the same level for a long time. That was part of the reason why I wanted to create the warehouse was because that gave me motivation to push through, get more creative, find more gigs. Um, cause I had that bigger overarching goal. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so what else is new that are you working on? Um, a lot of like passion projects and stuff on the side. Um, I just bought a new 3d printer and I'm 3d printing a full size bender from Futurama to be my new mailbox. Wow. Um, we're turning our house into a castle. We're about like 80, 90% of the way through that. <laughs> Wait, really? <laughs> yeah. When did you start turning your house into a castle? Uh, it's been almost a year. Um, <laughs> now that the weather's good, we're going to try to finish it in this next month while the, like it's not too hot or too cold. Okay. So define castle. It just looks like a castle or, um, yeah, uh, we bought a bunch of, um, what is it? Faux stone, yeah. um, panels and we've been lining them. It looks like a Mario castle right now. If you pull up, you haven't been in over in a while, but like it's 80, 90% done. Oh my God. Um, our house kind of looked messed up before. It was like a little bit of a trap house. And I was like, oh, I could make it look like every other house on the block. Or it looks kind of like a castle already. Why not? Yeah. And it's like added to the insulation, which is like brought our bills down. And it just looks so much better. Ah, that's interesting. What about the neighbors? Have they said anything like, what the I fuck th- are you guys doing? <laughs> I thought they were going to hate it, but they actually loved it because it just looks better than it did before. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the reason why I like this cabin house, because it looks different than other places. Mm-hmm. I It's hard for me to live in a normal house, because I just don't want to be like everyone else and live in one of these cookie-cutter houses. Yeah. that's. I've always wanted to live in a cave. A cave? Yeah. Like, I want my, my ultimate goal. Like, actual underground cave? Kind of. I mean, I could kind of do that with this place. It's a basement already, but... Um, just like maybe line the rooms up with like fake rocks and stuff. So I don't know, like instead of having like hard corners everywhere, yeah. I just feel like it'd be just gentler on your eyes and more relaxing if there was just like a bunch of rocks around and stuff. I don't know. That'd be awesome. 
I may have been a little high when I thought of this idea one time. <laughs> I mean, you're talking to someone who turned the house into a castle. I think yeah. you're in good company. Yeah. So, like, I always wanted to take a ca- like a, a shower in a cave. Yeah. And, like, have just, like, it's just, like, rocks everywhere. And then, then there's the water coming out. I think it would be pretty cool. Do it. I mean, I want to see that. Yeah. I feel like for space reasons, it wouldn't be very good. But, like, when people have, like, those little waterfalls in the pool and the jacuzzis, like, in a in a little cave in their pool outside. I just think it's the coolest thing ever. Let's see this turn into a cave. Yeah. What about a pool? You guys are going to get a pool at your place? Uh, we're looking at getting an above ground. Yeah. Um, just cause uh, as an investment, a pool is like one of the worst things you can do. Uh, it barely adds anything, uh, to the value of the house. So we're looking at getting like a four or five foot above ground pool and then building a deck around it. Yeah. Cause that'll cost us a couple grand to make versus like, 30 40 grand to like build in yeah interesting and then if you get tired of it you can always take it down exactly i always wanted a pool but i want like a a high dive tank oh shit we were recently looking into buying a high dive tank for like i don't know 15 20 grand or so yeah and then because we were thinking about doing high dive shows and then the more i thought about it i was like oh it's like two to three days to set up a high dive tank that's like we our stage is like four hours and i already think that's kind of a lot yeah i would prefer it to be two hours and then to move over into a two-day setup and then you have people like hanging like 20 30 60 feet in the air yeah putting stuff up but if it was just in my backyard all the time that would be pretty sweet to just walk outside and have like a 60 foot high dive how how deep do you need it to be for a, a high dive like that um i think 10 is pretty that's pretty standard yeah 12 would be ideal um but i was doing a high dive show and it was a 65 70 foot high dive and i believe the water was 11 feet deep wow that's way less than i would have thought uh yeah you uh i mean like you could go into nine foot if you have good technique yeah. and you know how to like scoop as you scoop like and then slide on like the, bottom. the first i would say the best way to put it is like the you graduate or you the opposite of gradually you increase your speed that you're slowing down as like the difference between eight and 10 feet is a lot. Yeah. But I don't know. I think you could probably do 10 feet safely. Yeah. That's sick. Yeah. As long like some people would hit the bottom too, if they didn't know how to like scoop. Cause as you do like a 60 foot high dive, as you hit, you kind of like, lift your chest back and then you as you go like that you'll kind of like sit on the bottom oh wow so i'm you have proper technique i'm good on that like i think i maxed out whenever we would go to the lake like at like the 20 foot i'm like "Ah, i don't need more than that oh yeah it's like the greatest feeling ever is like just jumping off like a 70 foot high dive and because you don't flip you actually jump and you like kind of look straight yeah and then you decide to flip like halfway through it that's what it feels like at least okay it's a good uh like a it's a mind game of like jump and just be super patient yeah like uh we did a i think it was like an 85 foot high dive or so in lake mead we went with leo one time and it was like all right i better like be very patient up here because i had no idea it was going to be this high Mm -hmm. so you just kind of jump and you just like look at the water and then you're like all right now i'll look back no i'm good (laughs) yeah it's fun it's a really fun feeling i don't like doing more than one flip though yeah like I'll do doubles every once in a while, but it's just fun to do. Like, it's like skydiving feeling. I remember that one time Leo jumped off like the 50 or 60 foot one and he threw that gainer uh, and landed hard. Like, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, but not my thing. I'll, I'll leave that for the younger guys. (laughs) (laughs) That's my retirement, uh, retirement plan. Oh shit. (laughs) I'm just kidding. It is fun though. And it's pretty good on your body as long as you don't flop. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, any advice for performers that you would like to give out, like to the younger people who are just getting started? What are like some tips you might give out to them? Um, ask questions. Like there, there are so many people that are just kind of trying to figure it out. Um, and there are a lot of people willing to like help you out. Uh, also like treat, treat not having a job as having a job. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, cause a lot of people are just That's sitting around one. waiting for, for gigs, but like just set like four or five things you need to do every day. Like wake up, like look at what your friends are gigging on, 
approach those companies or friend them on Instagram, Facebook, um, ask your friends questions, like just be hungry and like be working towards it. Uh, because I feel like the biggest thing, thing that can be detrimental to your career is not having a hustle. And a lot of performers don't have that. They're focusing more on the art and like focusing yeah. on leveling up their skills, but like the hustle and like those connections business wise, uh, building those relationships like you were talking about on the phone and yeah. whatnot. Um, that's just as important, if not more important than your skill level. Yeah. I always tell people they should continuously remind me that they're a performer too. Yeah. Because otherwise I will forget. And if you like follow up and I do have a gig coming up or something, you're more likely to get hired than if you just don't reach out or something, you know? So keep, don't just like reach out to them once, I would say continuously reach out to them like hey you got anything going on and sometimes you might feel like you're being annoying but it's the way to go yeah it's part of the game and like yeah just suck it up and do it and treat performing like it's like the cherry on top because the the whole like cupcake you know that's all of that hard work that you don't want to do but the more you do it the more you get to do performing um totally and also like educate yourself on business like yeah. Uh, that hustle mentality and just knowing business are like two things that I feel like most performers don't have. Um, and it's something you can educate yourself on just little bit by little bit, get some audiobooks. Like I know we're both like voracious readers when it comes to that kind of stuff. And yeah. I feel like that's kind of the key to our successes. Um, yeah. cause we're willing to like, know that like, Oh, I'm not good at this. Let me focus on this. Let me learn a bit. And like every little bit of that just adds. Yeah. Yeah, I find that too. The more well-rounded your skill set is, the better you can apply your skill set to things. Mm -hmm. Like I always say that the the best videographer isn't the one who creates the best video. It's the one who creates the video that makes the most money for the client. 100%. So like if you understand the business aspect of what you're selling, you're going to be better off than the person who's just very artistic. Yeah. And like look at like what you're – what you're selling like as a performer uh as a product um like what is your value add to your client like that was part of the reason of the led wheel it's because like most performers you come in you do an act clap move on but like the value add was like oh i can put your logo in this yeah. like we can program something custom for you and make you look like a badass which gets you the promotion which makes you hire us again like yeah, yeah definitely cool well thanks for coming on the podcast yeah. where can everyone find you out um, uh, David's Dream Factory on Instagram, YouTube, all the socials, um, and uh, the website is thevoltacreative.com. And yeah, thanks for having me. Cool. Thanks, Dave. All right, we'll see you guys in the next one. Make sure you guys subscribe. Bye-bye, everyone. That concludes this episode of the Off Axis Podcast. If you guys found value in this, please consider sharing with your friends. Also, subscribe, and we'll see you guys in the next episode. Bye, everyone.